I would like to start by saying it's a very, very great pleasure for me to be here today and how much I have enjoyed the two presentations which have preceded me and of course that makes it difficult. Um, I was asked when I first arrived did I want to speak first and I said no I don't think so, I'm not so sure anymore. Um, however, um, I'd like to thank uh, the three co-organisers -or of this meeting um, for inviting me to participate and for having the opportunity to uh, share reflections because what I want to do this morning is to share some reflections with you. And I think this is a very, it's another example of just how good the DGT in particular is at acting as a catalyst as we heard in the first presentation because perhaps my initial reflection is we need to do more of this if we are all going to fulfill the various different missions that we have in future-proofing the procession, the profession, I'm sorry, in equipping the next generation of translators. So that to me would be my initial point. And I find it very interesting that each of us has started, or I'm about to start, by explaining a little bit where we're coming from. Now that to me is probably a very good indication that we're very aware that we don't really know each other as well as perhaps we should. Now I think that is again one of my major reflections today. Um, so where am I coming from? I'm coming from the much maligned world of university translator training. I received translator training myself as an undergraduate here in the United Kingdom and then I have built my professional career in translator training in Spain. So again there, having gone through Switzerland briefly, so we have Geneva in common, David. Um, so I'm coming from the world of translator training at university level. I'm coming from the world of research into translator training. So how best do we help young people to become potential translators? And I'll come back perhaps a little to that a little bit later on. I'm coming from the very, very positive initial experience of the EMT project, the European Masters in Translation, which has been mentioned before, and which, of course, many of you are familiar with, and which, to my mind, independently, irrespectively of the details of the comment and of the content and the details of implementation, was a wonderful opportunity for the academic world and the professional world, the major translation service in Europe, to sit down together and talk for hours. And I have colleagues here, Christina and Geliki, who shared this wonderful experience with me to talk together for hours and hours over a period of almost three years about what we were doing, why we were doing it, whether we were doing the right thing and how much we could learn from each other. And that, I think, as again I said, is, is to me absolutely essential. I'm coming from there. I'm also coming from um, the very great privilege of having been able to spend the last seven years of my professional life a little bit further away from translation. And you may well say, oh, so you're not a specialist. You've moved too far away. But in actual fact, the last seven years of my academic life as, as vice rector, as someone very, very situated in university policy making, have helped me a great deal to understand how universities as institutions tick, why they tick as they do. I'm not sure whether that's the pulse level of the cardiology. <laughs> um, mixed metaphors. I'm not very good at being consistent with my metaphors. But again, I'm coming from there. And I think this is important. Because if we are to understand each other, we need to know where the bank is coming from. We need to know where the academic institution 
is coming from. Um, and although most of my professional life has been in Spain, so I'm particularly familiar with southern European university systems. I was trained in the UK, and I also have the privilege currently of chairing a European network of universities, many of which, the, the Coimbra group of universities, many of which have very, very prestigious translator training programs. Geneva, Heidelberg, Edinburgh, Bologna, Turku, and so on. So, quite a mix of, of approaches here. Now, I, I do have a presentation. We were asked to address three main questions. And we have, in addressing them, very interestingly, all three of us gone back in history. We've had Johnson and Dryden, we've had St. Jerome, and here we have, for those of you who are not familiar with this translator, Yuda Ibn Tibon, who is a Jewish translator, a Jewish medieval translator. Um, and that statue is in the city of Granada, which is why I thought I would share it with you today. Uh, Granada was, was one of the seats of a lot of the transmission of knowledge which went through translation in the Middle Ages with the intervention of both Jewish and Arab translators. I, I do like to use it as an illustration. <coughs> so we were asked to deal with three different questions, and what I have done in my presentation is really to run through each of them. Um, I don't know if that's an academic way of going about it or not, but I have. So I'm going to start with question one, but I'm very interestingly going to do something very similar to what Gourley did. And that is, I'm actually going to deconstruct the question a little bit. Um, the first question is, are translators being trained to meet the future expectations of work providers and users of translation services? OK. I think very often when that question is formulated in that way, the expectation is probably that we're going to say no, isn't it? To a certain extent, I, I felt that there was a lot of pressure there to answer no. And of course, I resist that pressure. Mm -hmm. And I, so, so I started to look at the question in a little bit more depth. And of course, one of the first things that I came up with was this verb train, which is, in academic circles, a very controversial verb. To train is considered to be something that belongs to vocational education. It is not considered to be something that universities should be involved in. Universities educate, they do not train. And I think that's, it's an interesting debate. I won't go into a great deal of depth about it, but it does have implications for the specialization debate. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just quickly, the, the second issue was where are translators trained or educated and why? And of course here, um, I think that there is a need for much greater, uh, shall we say, diversity. For some reason, in translator education, universities are expected to produce totally and utterly fit for purpose translators the day after they receive their degree. Now, I have always found this a very, very unfair expectation. Mm. And it is not an expectation of the law faculties. It is not an expectation of the medicine faculties. And I certainly would not want to put myself in the hands of a cardiologist who had only received her degree yesterday. So the whole issue of specialization is something we really need to reflect on. Universities are producing future translators. They're producing people with the initial competences. And I think Gurley has been through a very, very interesting list there of competences 
um, and perhaps as co-author I will allow myself to say that what I found most interesting about your review of competences were not the EMT translator competences, but the others. And the others are, of course, something that we at university are trying very, very hard to work on. Um, then, of course, the question, the, the question as it is posed begs the following question. What are and who defines the future expectations of work providers and users of translation services? We're not talking about today's expectations, future expectations. So not only do we want universities to produce specialized experts who are capable of doing the top end level of the job the day after they get their degree, but we are expecting universities to know what I suspect the work providers and the users of translation services do not know. That is, what are the future expectations? Now, we're supposed to know this when we design curricula, which if they are undergraduate, last for three or four years. If they are master's programs, last for one or two years, depending on our context. And then they're, they're supposed to work after we've had time to design this, have it approved, set it up, and actually have the first graduates. Now that is pretty tough. Hmm? So there is an increasing pressure on universities to produce what I think is practically the impossible. Hmm? And I think we should say this as academic institutions. And I don't think we should be afraid of saying it. Um, there are, quite apart from translation pressures on translator trainers, of course, there are huge, huge pressures on universities in general in society today to do more in less time for less money. You will all be familiar with this. So it's not only universities who are suffering this, of course, but we are not exempt. We are not exempt from that. Nor are we exempt from intervention of all kinds by public authorities and by the private sector. Um, and we're supposed to be able to do all of this, be on the top of the rankings, and generally be world class. Now, again, I think we need a touch of realism here. Um, and I think, and, and I would postulate, that in fact, if we look at all these enormous pressures and we compare ourselves with other disciplines across the board, translation studies or whatever we want to call our discipline has actually done pretty well. Hmm. Now, that would be, I think, my, one of my base points. Um, so, what is the role of universities in the training of professionals? That's more or less what I've been uh, trying to, to discuss with you today. And what is the situation in universities in Europe today? And I will just stop briefly uh, at that point to make a couple of general points, which of course have to affect translation studies also. And that is that <coughs> Universities, as I said, the world over are under this continuous pressure and this very, very strong pressure um, from public authorities, from funding authorities, and from the employers of our graduates. Um, but we are also, in the case of Europe, I'm not really very sure whether to include the UK in this particular case, in that we, I'm going to say we are in the throes of what is, again, a much maligned process, the Bologna process of reform of higher education in Europe. And, and I say I'm not sure whether to include the UK, those of you who work in the UK uh, academic institutions will, will, of course, help me with this. But when we have our meetings at European level and all the European representatives are terribly concerned about what is happening in Bologna, 
Most of the UK representatives seem to be blissfully unaware and terribly unconcerned about the Bologna process, what it has meant. Possibly because the UK was almost there anyway when it started. Hmm? Um, but now, why am I speaking about the Bologna process to a group of people who are really interested in the translation profession and the future of the translation profession? Well, because the Bologna process has changed universities, and I think that if we are to work together and if we are to get to know each other well enough to work productively together, then it is very important for not only universities, but society in general, employers, professional associations, and so on, also to understand what the Bologna process has meant for universities. And it has meant a very, very clear agenda that we should respond more to social needs. Now, I'm going to say social, I'm not going to say market, because the market is part of society and the needs universities must attend to are much broader than purely market needs. There are others also. So, but this awareness is something which has permeated and has pervaded curricular design in universities over the past few years, the past decade, more or less. Uh, the Bologna process ostensibly began in 1999. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what I believe are, in fact, 47 different Bologna processes, depending on the national context that you are in, um, but I do believe that that element is important. But I also believe that translation studies, and this has been discussed by many specialists in translator training, were, in fact, Bologna compliant before Bologna ever existed. And I do believe that if you read the literature on translator training, you will see that there has always been an awareness of the world out there, of what we would like our graduates to be able to do and why. Um, so I think that's important. It is also important because in many, many countries, the Bologna process has implied, has meant, um, a division of university education into cycles, uh, first cycle, second cycle, third cycle, so bachelor's, master's and doctoral level, which of course in the UK is pretty standard and we're all very, very familiar with, but for many, many translator training institutions across Europe, um, <coughs> this has been a major, major issue and has led to considerable reflection on what to do at which level should translator trainer, training, translator education be situated? Should it be first cycle undergraduate programs? Should it be second cycle master's programs? And how open should they be? And how specialized should they be? There's an awful lot of heart searching goes on there. And then what is the role, of course, of the third cycle and, and research training uh, in the field of translation? So. Um, these are all issues that universities have been dealing with. Uh, there seems to be fairly strong consensus that translator education should, in general, be situated at the master's level. Now, I say fairly general consensus, um, speaking as a professor at a university in Spain, where there are 23 possibly more, because we lose count, undergraduate programs in translation. And this happens also, of course, in many other countries. Um, and this is, a, I believe, and I think it is important for us as academic institutions to look very carefully at what we do. I believe that is a mistake. I believe that what is necessary at undergraduate level is, is a much more general approach to communication to interlingual communication, to intercultural communication, and that the more specialized translation skills should come at second cycle. I'm not sure, however, they quite reach the degree of specialization that David was talking to us about, nor can I say, do I believe they necessarily should. And I think that's important too, because I think that 
after graduation, there is an awful lot of training that happens. There's a lot of self-training that happens. There's a lot of in-house training, formal and informal in-house training. And I believe that should always exist. Um, the second question, and I'll be quite quick on this one perhaps, um, is are they equipped with the skills they need to deal intelligently with technological change? Now, basically I think here my message is the demands coming to academic institutions from the language industry are very often incredibly short-termist in this respect. Uh, and we hear things like, you know, well, the translator needs to be able to sit down on day one and be able to use this particular software. And again, I won't name names. Um, I don't think that's true. I think the translator needs to be able to work with, with software for translation but not necessarily with one particular platform, not necessarily with the particular version of that particular platform which this particular translation agency is using, and so on. And the translator, the new translation graduate, needs to be aware of what kind of software is available, needs to be able to critically use that software, and needs to be aware of the impact of the use of the software on their translation decision-making processes. And here I come back to the translator as an expert. And I think, David, your, your discussion of the face-to-face -face, face -face meetings with the CFO and the CEO, um, I believe that's a major, major skill. Interpersonal skills, the ability to act as an expert at the same level with other experts in other fields, the ability to justify translation decisions is something that universities need to work on a little bit more, but I do actually know that we are working on these skills and that a lot of our methodology in the classroom is based on helping our students to justify their decisions. Now that to me is an essential, absolutely essential skill. And that's one of the things that I, I just want to say. I believe that the role of universities then in equipping translators with skills has to be based on the, it has to go back to basics, and I'm not using the term as it was used by a British politician at one point. Um, we are responsible for the essentials of translator competence. Mm. If those essentials aren't there, the rest doesn't really matter because it can't work. So we need to be sure that we are giving the essentials of translator competence. But we also need to be sure, and I won't go into the the actual content of those competences, because Gourley has already mentioned them earlier. We also need to be sure, however, that we are developing these generic skills, the interpersonal skills, the ability to analyze, the ability to act as an expert and justify one's own decisions and, and professional performance. Um, and of course, this has to link in in the world in which we live, because the world in which we live is a world which is changing much, much faster than it ever has at any point in history. And, and we've all gone back to history, but we all know that progress and change was much, much slower if we go back to St. Jerome when we move into the Middle Ages and we come forward. Today, change is so, so fast that it is very, very difficult. And here I'm not 100% sure whether I agree with Gourley. Are we training people for a profession of a lifetime? However much that profession evolves and we evolve with it. Um, I suspect today's world, in fact, requires that its academic institutions help people to be able to learn, to evolve, and to adapt, rather than to fit into a slot which they then maybe will not move out of. And I think that's essential for us also. So, the adaptability, the flexibility, the ability to learn, the ability to analyze, the ability to reflect. Now that needs time. Reflection needs time. So again, we need to build that time into our curricular design 
And it needs time, it needs experience. We can't expect a 23-year-old graduate to be able to reflect and analyze the same way that most of us, there are no 23-year-old graduates in the room either, most of us, I think, are slightly older, the way we analyze and reflect. Um, what part can academic institutions, professional bodies and international organisations play in preparing new and current practitioners for the challenges facing the profession? I think to a certain extent I have answered some of those questions. I have highlighted academic institutions because that is where I am coming from and where I feel authorised to speak. Um, what can we do? We can make sure that our curricular design is reflective analytical and takes account of its context. Its context is multiple, it is not only the language industry, but we need to make sure that we take that context into account. And of course, we need to make sure that that curricular design allows us to promote generic competences, transferable competences. There are all sorts of research issues around the whole thing of transferable skills and what does transfer mean and how is knowledge transferred and I won't go into that today. Um, but simply the ability to um, act as a critical and aware citizen in a very, very complex world today. To me, those are the essential generic skills. Um, we need to be in constant <coughs> contact with the profession. <coughs> with the professions, perhaps I should say. Um, but the professions in the broadest sense, not just the industry, but also the associations, the professionals themselves, and a very, very useful way that many of us find of being in contact with the professions is through our own graduates, which is where we find out whether what we're doing is actually working because they can come back and say, hey, you know, it's great because what we learnt with you is just what we wanted, just what we needed. Or they can come back and say, well, what a disaster. You know, really nothing we did in the classroom has been of any use whatsoever. Normally they come somewhere in between. This was great, this wasn't so useful. But then, of course, each person's individual experience post-university is different, and we have to put them all together. Because one of the other conditions which we as universities have to work under is that of course we have to serve the whole society. We can't just serve the very, very, very top end. Okay. Um, but we need to bring professions into our reflections on curricular design, on the evaluation of our curriculum, of our curricula and how we enhance those, those curricula. We need, of course, to bring in staff from the professional world of translation. I will say what I always say here uh, when people say, yes, you need to get professionals in. And I go, wait a minute. <laughs> we're all professionals. But we're all professionals of different things. Okay. Um, yes, universities need to have professionals from the world of translation come in on a full-time, on a part-time basis. Um, permanently, temporarily, short term, long term, yes, but universities also need professional educators. And I would please plea that we do not forget that. Universities are educators, that's what we're there for. Um, there's an awful lot going on, and I'm not going to go into any detail, but there are huge um, innovations in translator education methodology at our universities. There are many, many, many forms of simulation of professional environments in the classroom, outside the classroom, with authentic commissions and so on. And I believe this is something that we need to continue to do that I'm sure we can improve on, probably with your help, but this is something which does already exist. Sometimes we don't get that message across very well. Hmm? We're not very good at marketing in universities. We're not very good at all at marketing in universities. Um, we need, and we need your help for this, we need to make sure that we have meaningful and productive internships on our programmes. Now, I will say that this is a criticism we often receive. You're not offering enough internships. 
but in actual fact, it's not the universities who offer the internships. <coughs> it's the language industry that offers the internships. And we know it's time-consuming and costly, and it gets in the way. But if you want us to offer a better education, we need you to work with us in this. And I think that is also an important message. And of course, well, I won't go into the detail of other minor aspects such as site visits and so on. The other two areas, and I will not go into any detail on either of them, where of course universities can also participate, help, support, is in continuous professional development. This is something that universities in some national contexts do extremely well. It is also something that universities in other national contexts do very badly. Um, and I will say that the south of Europe is not particularly good at this, but I believe the north of Europe is, in fact, pretty good on continuous professional development. Um, and then, of course, in the research. Because universities don't only teach. Universities have two major missions, and I won't go into the other third and fourth missions, but they have two major missions, education and research. And of course, the research that can be done at universities can also feed into better education, better, better um, knowledge of where things are going, which might help us to predict the future a little better. A little better. I think we should always be very, very careful when we're predicting the future. Um, so we can do research into the market, the professions, the reception of translations, and this is interesting from the quality point of view. What is quality? Mm. Um, perceived quality? I think quality is always perceived. Um, I don't think there's any intrinsic quality as such. And you know, for a lot of people, Google Translate gives them what they want. Well, is there necessarily anything wrong with that? Mm. So reception of translations, technologies, terminology, and training. We, we do a lot of research into how to improve our, our training. So this would bring me to my takeaways, which are not on, on a slide. But I think my major, major takeaway is we need more cooperation. We need to know each other better. And we need to work together more and better. And I think with that, I shall say thank you. Thank you.